Wonderful, mahalo. So welcome again, everyone, to our Wood from Food Edible and what's Education one, uh, webinar. What's one thing you know about fungi? Yeah, what's um, one thing you know about fungi? Put it in the chat box. Grow in the dark. <gasps> so we will begin um, um, with protocol and um, we welcome Homai Bertelman from the beautiful town of Kamuela, Waimea, um, and um, to begin yes. us with protocol so that we're ready to spend our time, to spend our time together, uh, learning, sharing, and enjoying um, each other. So... Kia aloha nui a kako, aloha nui mai wai mea mai um, a kamokupuni o Hawaii. Um, it is really good to be here with all of you guys this evening and I am going to potentially help to bring all of us together under the um, resonance of sound and um, through the oli that is titled A'ala Le Mwele. Um, it speaks about the place that is home to me, that reared me. And it is actually where I first met Ko Mingwe and Amanda Ryu, who have really become some amazing teachers for me in my lifetime. Um, and it describes, so for those of you who are sitting into this space now, um, it describes the aina around me and all of the pool and who make up home and the couples to each one of them and the Kapu not in the sense of something so sacred that you cannot touch it, but kapu in the sense that um, it provides opportunity for reverence and resonance and renewal of spirit um, and provides for nourishment in, in those ways. And the, the kapus that it talks about is a couple of water that comes in the form of rain clouds, in the form of streams, um, in the forms of all of the apu, all of the really small apu all the depressions um, on Mauna Kea um, that I look at every morning and that is there when we sleep. So, um, aloha nui ho, my pu kapu o aimea thing. Aala le mai le o pu ka pu ka pu a i a ku a i ke ki pu pu ka li a i na ki a i a ka la ni wa ma la ma ka ma lu o pu o o pu li ho na ma ka ya pu ka la i ki mai o ka la na na ya ka li a li a la i ma ka i ka na ni a o a i me a o a i ha va na va na ka pu o la ni ma o ma O ke au kaulana pili a mauna awa ke ahe a mai e kaleo o na velo kupu na gani na kolo na pali kapu o na li ie 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 ie. Aloha nui, aloha nui, aloha nui, mahalo. Mahalo po mai. Um, it's so wonderful to have so many of you with us. Again, my name is Mingwei, and I'm so happy to see all of you in person um, after just 500 emails from me, huh? Um, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce uh, one of our newest uh, Ohana in our farm to school hui. Most of you know that we are a statewide hui and every island except Kauai tonight is represented and members of our statewide Farm to School Hui are with us. And it's my greatest pleasure to introduce your host for tonight, um, Kristen Jamison. Kristen is the junior extension agent with CETA, College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. And her, her foci is in Waianae where she is really gathering energy and momentum around farm to school, getting local food um, available to our Haumana and Keiki and community. So i um, very, very happy that you're part of our Ohana, Kristen, and it's over to you. Mahalo. Thank you, Mingwei. Um, let me pull up my screen really quick here. 
Um, so, so excited to have people from all over the state here today um, and a lot of really wonderful teachers from wine, I think, to pals and places. Um, so everyone should have received one of these um, grow bags from Opala Foods. Um, so this is one of the things that you'll want with you today. And then you also should have one of these packets that will be going through um, four different lessons that um, five of our wonderful teachers and educators and community members have put together around these mushroom bags that are inspired by the Hawaii School Garden curriculum map. So we'll be here until seven today. Um, we'll start off with Loxley Clovis um, sharing about um, the magic behind mushrooms. Um, our mushroom farmers from Apollo Foods will take us through how to care for the mushrooms. And then we'll dive in for learning about um, how to engage with our mushrooms from cooking them to uh, making art with them to doing science and observation with them and hopefully finish up here at seven o'clock today. So with that, I will pass it off to Loxley. Um, one more thing, um, a couple of Zoom protocol that you guys are all pretty good with now, but um, please try to stay on mute and ask any questions in the chat box. And we are recording today. So if you don't want your face to be in the recording, um, just make sure you turn off your video. So over to you, Loxley. Oh, wait, sorry, um, Kristen, I was going to introduce Loxley. <laughs> Please do. Thank you, Mingwei. Thank you. Lox so Loxley is in Maui, and he's a, a, a permaculture gardener, farmer, teacher, historian, and most of all, a mycologist. Um, he runs Backyard uh, Regeneration Permaculture and Mushroom Consulting at backyardregeneration.com. And the way we know Loxley, again, has got to do with the wonderful farm to school hui. Loxley's partner, Rhapsody, is a member of our farm to school hui. And that's how we got to meet um, Loxley. So it's just so wonderful, Ohana involved. So over to you, Loxley, mahalo. Mahalo. Aloha kako o Luxley ko u inoa no wailuku mayao e mahi ai o ma malu ao. Hello everyone, my name is Luxley. I live in Wailuku and I am a mushroom farmer. And Kristen, if you could just confirm that I shared my screen correctly, I'm going to try to do that now. Good? All right. Yep. We are remembering. We are remembering a relationship that started over 18,000 years ago. A relationship of magic. We are remembering a relationship that healed us and allowed for the transportation of fire across great distances. A relationship filled with aroma, meditation, and ceremony. We are remembering a relationship of mysticism. We are celebrating the millennial anniversary, the millenniversary of our relationship of co-cultivation. We are remembering a relationship of co-creativity a relationship of celebration. We are remembering a relationship that has cured us. A relationship of coexistence.
we are remembering a relationship with the senses. A relationship of wholeness. But I just want to add in there. Of unity. I want to take off the last. We are remembering a relationship of beauty. A relationship of protection. We are remembering a relationship with mutual omnipresent patterns. A relationship of cohabitation. We are remembering a relationship that was severed and the feelings of heartbreak. A relationship of persistent, excessive, unnecessary fear. But we know we have nothing to fear because we are remembering a lineal ancestral connection that is 1300 million years old. A relationship that more than likely started much earlier than 18,000 years ago. Okay, so I've also been invited to speak about resident species here on the island. Um, I'm really, really excited that everybody's also getting very, very excited and interested in fungi. And I would like to combine my excitement about the local resident ecology here and protecting it with my, ex my equal excitement with fungi. So I wanna just highlight some of the resident species here. Some of them you may be very familiar with, others you may not. And resident species that may present an opportunity for us to work together with. Um, so these are culinary, medicinal, and companion mushrooms that are residents of this archipelago. According to George Wong, endemic and native mushrooms likely arrived via wind, wing, and wave a long, long time ago. And according to Don Hemmings, mushrooms above 4,000 feet in elevation in native forests appear to be endemic. Anything in the lowlands is likely introduced. I personally know of no endemic species that are of culinary or medicinal use to humans. There may be, but I just, I'm not familiar with them. But probably uh, the one to highlight the most is our local pepiao. Um, in its uh, auricularia polytrica, according to Art Medeiros and Dennis Desardin, um, this mushroom is native to all the Pacific Islands. They're commonly cooked in soups and stir fries. And multiple studies have shown medicinal properties, including an anticoagulant. So it's not recommended to consume if you're on blood thinners, for example. How Pepiao originally got to Hawaii is currently unknown, though Elias Magnus Fries recorded auricularia on Oahu in 1823, according to George Wong. So it could have arrived via wind, wing, or wave, or possibly even been brought over in a canoe resident in Kukui Wood, which is often where I find it in the wild. Um, according to Schneck and Dudley at the Hawaii Agriculture Research, Research Center, quote, Pepiao were known to the early Hawaiians and became an export product to the Chinese in China 
and San Francisco during the late 1800s. So there's actually a history of agricultural use of papiao and as an export product. Uh, turkey tail, Tramides versicolor, has a cosmopolitan distribution, meaning it's found all over the world. It's often seen growing on dead wood in forests all over Hawaii. Traditionally, it's often consumed in teas, and many modern studies show impressive medical applications, verifying traditional Chinese medicine's promotion of yun shi for certain ailments. Artist conk. In the bottom left, Ganoderma aplanatum is also a, has a cosmopolitan distribution. It's found all over the world and then forth on dead wood all over Hawaii. You can draw artistic representations on underneath. And so artists like to use it. And it also has uh, culinary uses as a flavor enhancer. Um, it's not digestible in a raw form, nor is any mushroom really but it is used for cooking because of its rich mushroom flavor. Blending with filtration or cold pressing in water is a common method for creating Ganoderma, Ganoderma drinks. Hot herbal soups or fermentation and lemon acid with onion is a common use for cooking with artist comp. And it, adding slices adds an umami flavor to food. It also has medicinal applications traditionally used in Chinese medicines. And studies have shown that Ganoderma aplanatum contains compounds with potent anti-tumor, antibacterial, and anti-fibrotic properties. One that I'm really excited about is this one in the bottom right, Macaria proxima, because it actually is a mycorrhizal fungus, meaning it forms a beneficial symbiotic relationship with many roots of many different types of plants, particularly this mushroom associates with conifers, pines, and eucalypts. So that's an interesting one that we can possibly partner with when we're doing food forests or orchard type work. Um, and then we have uh, oyster abalone. It's one of our local Pleurotus genus. We also have the phoenix mushroom, which is an oyster commonly found on conifers, which is interesting because not many edible or medicinal mushrooms uh, grow well on conifers. Um, it's edible and found on rotting logs in Hawaii. Uh, snow fungus, Tremella fucaformis, can be cooked in soups. Now is the season for so snow fungus. I'm seeing it everywhere. And I just found out recently that bird's nest fungi is currently being studied as a potential treatment for pancreatic cancer. So we've got a lot of really cool resonant mushrooms here that we can work with. So I really um, highly recommend looking for these in the wild. If your methods are um, pretty higher level, then you could clone these and start offering local spawn of local species. Um, I'm open to partnering with people in doing this. I'm currently creating my own local spawn of local species, local master spawn, so people can grow out local species and local strains. I also teach classes on mycology and permaculture. So yeah, get a hold of me if you're interested in collaboration. Mahalo. Mahalo, Loxley. There's one question. Is there a mimic of turkey tail that is poisonous? Um, not, not that I've seen on the island. There's only, in the literature that I've found, there's only one poisonous polypore. That's a, you know, the shelf bracket fun, fungus that has a polypore underneath. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it starts with an H. I can't pronounce it, but I haven't seen one on the island. Um, there's none that I know of, but I could be wrong. Great. And there was a comment here about um, eating uh, mushrooms raw. And um, it is from what I understand in my research, it is not recommended. Um, it it's is not much better. Mainly, never. Yeah. It's not it's recommended for multiple reasons, but mainly because the cell walls are made out of chitin. That's the same thing that uh, crab shells are made out of. So we can't digest, our stomach enzymes can't digest chitin. So you can eat it, but you won't get any nutritional benefit from it. You got to break down the chitinous cell wall by cooking it. 
Wonderful. And Loxley, if you don't mind putting in a chat box to everyone, the Don Hemi's um, reference, you know, the, the local, our, our Hawaii, our Hawaii mycologist, you mentioned his name. And if you have an opportunity at some point, would you please put it in the chat box? And again, everyone, um, keep the comments coming and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have the Q&A going. Thank you, Loxley, so much for sharing your mana. Oh, it's just wonderful. Thank you. Um, Kristen. The world of mushrooms is so big. Um, we are going to pass it on over to our other mushroom farmers, Noah Brown and Elijah Crow with Opala Foods here on Oahu. Um, they're the ones to thank for your mushroom grow kits, your ready to fruit bags. Um, Noah and um, Eli run Opala Foods over in Kaneohe, um, and I will pass it on over to them. We are so grateful for their partnership and enthusiasm on bringing their knowledge to the educational space. Um, thanks for talking about safety and how to care for your bags, and I'll pass it over to you. All right, hey everybody. Uh, my name's Noah. Um, I'll be kind of going over uh, basically what to do when you get your bag and then how to get started. Um, so as, as Kristen showed earlier, your bag's going to look like this. Um, what you're going to do to get started is take this gray piece right here completely off. This is the filter. You're not going to break it by doing anything. Just, just pull it off um, and leave this red red collar in place. Uh, this is where the, the mushrooms are actually going to fruit out of, out of this portion right here. Um, the most ideal system is to use a storage bin like this uh, and then drill a bunch of holes in it. And what's gonna happen is all the air is gonna be able to, to blow through and you get fresh air coming in for the mushroom. Uh, but, they, but then you're gonna spray the walls inside of here with water and that's gonna keep the humidity high so you can get good, um, good uh, fruit formation. After a couple of days, maybe a week or so, depends on how well you're doing at keeping the humidity up. And the humidity, humidity has to be high the entire time uh, until you start, so you get uh, pinning to start. Um, so you wanna spray it at least probably three times a day, but just plan on uh, every time you check Instagram, just go ahead and spray the, the bin and you'll be fine. Um, after a little while, you'll get, I don't know if I can get this close enough. Um, so this is the very start of pinning probably a little over 24 hours uh, into the process, you should get a good, good set of pins right here like this, right? Um, you can keep the humidity up and then another day or so, and it'll be about like this. And when you go to harvest it, you're just gonna like get in here and grab it by the base and then just kind of twist and pull it off. Um, there's gonna be a little bit right here that may have some de debris on it from uh, from the bag, just trim that off, keep everything else and cook it. Uh, if you don't have one of these grow bins, uh, you know, a storage to a storage bin that you can use, there's a couple other methods um, and, and you're gonna have to kind of tailor it to your own needs because people who live in like a really dry, windy area, uh, you're gonna need to be a lot more vigilant about keeping the humidity up. If you're in a uh, really humid spot that, you know, rains all the time, like us in Kanye A, you could have uh, like completely forget about your bag and, and it still work out for you, but I don't, I don't recommend doing that. Um, anyway, so when I started playing around with alternative ideas, I uh, just used a little paper bag and put over the top of it. Um, the problem was the paper bag dried out way too quickly. So I put another bag over top of it, plastic bag, you get humidity inside of it, poke some holes in the bag, um, that's covering the end of this uh, and that allows the airflow. Um, the disadvantage of using this particular like a uh, sandwich bag size is that it's gonna be hard for your fruit to grow out of it. So thought about it a little bit more and get a bag of chips and same thing, cut a bunch of holes in it, slide this over top of it and while you're, you know, just spray the inside of it, put your bag inside of it and then Toasty does, I'm gonna holler at them for a minute. It's got a clear viewport and you can actually see it and you can actively check on it and see how it's growing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's it. Um, if, you, if you're if you struggling with it um, to, to get it to fruit, uh, you can take the cap off of it and then add a bit of water uh, to the top of this. Just let it sit for a couple of hours. 
and then drain off any excess water and start again. Um, if, your, if your bag doesn't fruit, it's gonna be because there's not enough humidity. If, you're if your bag does fruit and then you get like some really weird shapes, then we can talk about like changing the airflow or something like that. But um, if you keep the humidity up, the bag's gonna fruit. It should take about seven to 10 days before you start seeing anything. Um, and then at, once you start seeing a little bit of activity on there, uh, it'll be about another three days or so until you're ready to harvest. Um, you, just, you, can, you can spray it directly as well. You can spray inside of the collar, um, like you can spray directly inside of here. Um, it's using like a, a light mister, a little spray gun, a little dollar, dollar uh, thing from Walmart. A um, bunch of different ways to do it. Just make sure that you keep the humidity high at, at this, this cap part of it. Um, also, try not to uh, cut everywhere else on the bag or like empty the bag or anything like that. Like it's, it's a lot of people have the urge to do it. Just take the cap off of it and then fruit out of, out of the collar. Um, maybe the best way to start. And then I don't have one here, um, but it, it does occasionally like, you know, through transport or whatever, you will get a, uh, a hole here and have a mushroom come out of it. That's perfectly fine. Um, it's just the, the more openings you have, the smaller the fruits you'll get. Um, so for the best results, try and fruit out of here. If something does come off the, the side of it, you can leave it, let it grow, or you can you know, go ahead and pick it off and then tape it over and, and, and it'll, it'll keep trying to push out the front of it. Um, oh, uh, your mushrooms are going to spore quite a bit. That's this, this preferred reproduction method, but like everything under here, and Kristen's gonna talk about this area later, but um, you're gonna have a lot of spores coming out of it. It's not enough to be a health hazard for anybody really, but uh, if you see like, a bit of like white dust all around the bottom of it, no worry, that's, it's, just, it's a normal part of the process. So, um, I don't know, do you have any, any, any questions? No, okay. we're getting a lot of questions. I'll oh, go ahead, Mingwei. Yeah, I was going to group them. I was going to group the questions because they, the, the flushing in, haha. -ha. So maybe the first thing to address is the whole idea of the flushes, Noah. Okay. So a I, lot yeah. of questions about the flushes and are they going to give me number two? Are they, they going to keep growing? So would you address flushing? Okay. So um, a, a flush is a harvest. Um, we, so we start from the beginning, I guess. What's inside of here, we call substrate. That's going to be a mixture of uh, wood, grain, um, sugarcane, big ass, straw, uh, uh, sometimes coffee grinds, sometimes uh, uh, grain from the breweries around here. Uh, but anyways, everything that goes inside of here is your, your substrate blend. When it starts to fruit, it's like they're not actually fruits, like an orange or whatever, but it's, it's what we term them. Uh, when they're really small, we call them pins. Um, and then when you get a full flush, you're, you know, you're ready to harvest. This is, is a cluster, right? Um, yeah, so uh, does that get us where we... Yeah, and um, team expect... So this summer when we ran a pilot, I got four flushes. I believe that's because I live in Lower Puna on the island of Hawaii where the humidity is so high. I really believe that's why I got four flushes. So just pay attention to your, to your mushrooms. Second question is my favorite. F-A-E, Noah and Eli, can you please address the importance of F-A-E? So FAE is fresh air exchange. Um, that's going to be the second most important part of this, right? So humidity, 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 and then once you get it, once you get fruits to come out, um, you want to like pay attention to the shape that they're coming out. Um, if they're when you're at this stage, it's always going to be long and skinny. It's going to be mostly stems. That's just because there's a, going to be more CO2 in here, and it's just trying to grow. But once from here on out, if you're if you're seeing like um, looks like little sticks or logs coming out or they're deformed uh, in any way, uh, in, in a way that doesn't look like this, right? Um, then you're, you're probably having too little fresh air exchange. So oysters are really sensitive to the CO2 concentration. Um, and when they're in a high CO2 environment, they're going to be really long and skinny. 
Um, this is actually how you get enoki mushrooms. They're not, they don't look that way in nature. You grow them like this with a tube over top of it to make it a high CO2 environment all the way up and they stay long and skinny. Um, we don't want that for oysters. It, it doesn't work out the same. Uh, they're, they're not as tasty when you try to do it that way, at least. Um, and, and going back to the earlier question about how many flushes you can get or how many harvests you can get or your, your total weight and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in practice, so we use we use these bags in, in our um, our freezing chamber, which is basically the size of a 40 foot shipping container. But um, we use these bags and, and we typically pull them out after our second harvest. The reason we do that is because the longer it's, you know, you have an open spot in a high um, a, a humid environment, the, the, the longer it's there, the, the more risk of contamination you have. So it's for us, it's a best practice. We pull it out uh, just so we don't have, you know, um, fungus gnats or anything like that that we have to deal with. Um, for you, you don't have that concern. So you can, this will basically keep fruiting until there's no more, <clears throat> there's no more moisture inside um, uh, to, to, to keep the process going. So the mycelium will still be alive. Um, it's just, you're gonna quit trying to fruit when the, um, when the clusters are so small that you're like, I'm not gonna bother keep spraying this every day for a week. You know, I'm only going to get, you know, a quarter ounce or something like that. Um, <clears throat> your first couple of flushes will probably get you somewhere around a half a pound if, if you do a good job keeping the humidity up. So. Thank you so much. There's a lot of discussion on the chat around substrate. Would you mind saving that for our, Terry is our third presenter. Um, Terry Moniz, because he is going to segue into the whole discussion about substrate. So if you guys don't mind, hang on to those comments and questions about substrate and for us to get to our um, presenter, our educator number three, four. I'm, I'm, I'm losing track already. Sorry, guys. One last question, Noah. Um, so I'm holding up. Someone had a comment about plastic bag with holes. Mm -hmm. So last is any other tips on um, if we don't have a bin, what else can we use? And how, you know, do you store it in a dark place, light place? How much air do they need? So three things, uh, alternatives to bins, uh, uh, light, um, uh, and, um, uh, light and dark and yeah, thanks. Two things. Yeah. Okay. So, um, mushrooms are grown in the dark uh, in your vegetative stage. So, in the first couple of weeks, getting us to to this stage before we've taken the cap off of it, we're going to grow this in a, in a dark room. Um, it's going to be in the, the the mid 70s, and it'll sit there for a couple of weeks. Um, it's going that is actually going to be a high CO2 and low light environment. Okay. Um, once you all get it, you want to switch the conditions. You want to have a bit of light. Since mushrooms don't use um, uh, they, they don't they use light for photosynthesis, right? They they make their own food. Um, you, you don't. It, it's just a triggering mechanism for it. So like basically, if you can see the bag, then there's enough light for it. Um, like like I don't. That's not like a joke. Or like if you can see the bag, there's enough light. If you have um, if you plan on having this uh, outdoors or like you know like, um, it, wherever just make sure that it's not going to be in a particularly sunny area because the sun's going to dry it out. Uh, and it, it may overheat, but most likely you're just going to dry it out and you're never going to be able to keep the humidity up. Um, so you want to be like in a shaded area. Ideally, you'll have it indoors, um, ideally in a high traffic area so that you'll walk past it and be like, oh yeah, I need to spray this. I need to miss this. I need to keep the humidity up. Um, if you put it in your closet, you're probably going to forget about it. And then, you know, like the next day, be like, oh crap, I forgot to water it. And then you'll be that, that much further behind. Um, I, was, I think there's one more question in that. Um, we're getting a lot of spore questions um, and Eli's trying to capture them. Is there some way Eli can show his face? <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. I know he doesn't want to um, because he's- yeah I'm, in, the, yeah, he's yeah, I'm in my room right now. Hi no. Eli. Hi there, hi everybody. Half. So um, Eli is the mycologist of this lovely of Noah and Eli, our, our Apollo Foods. And Eli is really very active on chat. So you guys might have to scroll up and down and answer. 
Yeah, I've been trying, want... to, trying to handle the questions on the chat while Noah's talking. <laughs> Eli, why don't you, I, I, I know we're running a little late, but I think Eli, would you address the 500 questions on spores? Yeah, so the why... spores are gonna be uh, coming out pretty active, um, especially right as the mushrooms are getting ready to pick their mature. Um, so that's one of the great indicators. Um, yes, you can recapture the spores. However, it's gonna be incredibly difficult to use them for any purposes. <laughs> um, generally, I've captured some of our wild spores, but there's this long intensive uh, cleanup process in the lab that you, you have to utilize um, in order for us to clean it up because there's so many other microbes that are, that are present just in the ambient air and just on general surfaces as I think we've all come to realize with this COVID thing. <laughs> um, so yes, you can try to capture them and use them, um, but your, your success rate is probably gonna be really low, I'd say. Um, I wouldn't use them to be inoculating almost anything unless you have a, like, unless you clean it up with agar. So I, I hope that answers most people's questions on that. Thank you, Eli. Thank you so much. All right, back to you, Kristen. Wait, there's one more question I think is a really good question. This is Amanda. I'm also monitoring the chat. Somebody asked how long the bag would be good if they don't open it right away. And I think that's a really important question. So the mycelium is going to be good for a, a couple of weeks while it's in there. Um, ideally, I think we're sending you guys things that have been um, fully colonized for about at least a week. Um, generally, you want to pop it earlier um, as the, I guess, the growth stage of the mycelium will start to senesce inside the, the log if you, if you wait too long. The other thing that might happen if you let it sit there is... Um, these are a, a, a different set of uh, bags that we have. This is our pink oyster mushroom, though. Uh, and it's actually grown through the filter itself. And we've had this happen on our smaller bags as well as our, our big ones. If you forget about it or you, or, or, uh, you let it sit for a while, um, it can actually just grow through the filter and like, it, it'll, it'll force its way out. So. All right, thank you so much, Noah and Eli. I think we are ready to move on to our teacher presenters to kind of learn some of the things that we can do with our mushrooms as they grow. So now's a good time to get out your mushroom packet. Um, and these are, we, in here we have four really wonderful groups of lessons that were designed um, by our teachers. And so the first one is gonna be going into sense of place. Um, and so with that, we'll pass it over to Ming Wei to introduce Lauren DeMint. Mahalo, Kristen. So I met Lauren DeMint through an amazing um, conservation program we have here on Hawaii Island called Teaching Change. And it's a program where we combine phenology, which is the study of cycles, really. When does something fruit or flower or um, you know, give you seeds? And using the idea of deep observation, uh, the word we can use here is kilo, to understand about conservation and to learn more about our place. So that's how I met Lauren a few years ago and had the wonderful opportunity to, to uh, watch her educate children and adults right here on our wonderful big island. And so Lauren is an amazing educator loves plants, she's all about plants and fungi, and is currently um, educating Keiki and adults at Imiloa Observatory, where she's uh, leading the, the cultivation of a, of a native um, garden, um, agroforest kind of thing here in Imiloa. So if you ever have a chance, please uh, visit uh, Imiloa. So over to you, Lauren, thank you very much for for being with us. Yeah, thank you for the lovely introduction, Mingwei, and um, mahalo for all the information that everyone has shared so far. I do not claim to be a mushroom expert. I am learning um, just as long with everybody else, and all of this was very, very new to me when I first started um, this summer with 
you know, just getting a whole bunch of us teachers to try all these bags and, you know, see what kind of lessons could we come up and develop with it. So I am a recent graduate from the Kahoi Vai Teacher Education Program. Um, I forgot to say I'm, I'm here in Hilo. <laughs> um, and I got my degree in elementary education, so kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, like Mingwei said, I have a strong background in conservation. Um, I, um, before working with Teaching Change, I worked up with Three Mountain Alliance and Volcano growing thousands of native plants um, and restoring our native forests. So I feel really, really comfortable in that zone. So working with food um, is a little bit of a jump and transition for me. But I think mushrooms are really, really amazing. And the more I kind of observed it, I realized that in some of these forests, I was getting a chance to go and visit um, here on Hawaii Island. A good indicator usually of a healthy forest was when you saw mushrooms and that cycle happening, you know, with water and moisture and just, you know, decomposition. And it's a really good sign usually, I guess, when you see mushrooms, I'm realizing. So um, I, I'm also the garden teacher at Ha'aheo Elementary School here on Hawaii Island, which has been an amazing and very um, humbling experience. And then also here at Imiloa, I'm the Native Plant Garden Education Associate. So right now we're creating a whole bunch of curriculum and lesson plans for students in grades, kindergarten through fifth grade. And next week we're doing um, a whole thing on mushrooms that we're really, really excited about. Um, a lot of kilo and observations. I'm going to share my screen. I know you guys have some of the um, packets, but it'll help me out to see it as well. All right. All right, so I'm, can you guys, I believe, see my screen? Um, no, I cannot. Oh, you cannot. Okay, let me try again. Um, how about now? Looks great. Okay, great. I'm going to blow it up. So mushroom lessons. Um, the first one that I kind of am going to kick it off with next week is just parts of an oyster mushroom. In kind of learning all this, I was like, whoa, there's so many mushrooms out there. But I wanted to keep a focus and keep it based on you know what the students are going to be observing, what are parts of the mushroom. So really I learned with the oyster mushroom, it's pretty basic. It's just really three main parts, um, the cap, gills, and stem. I thought it was amazing to know that the gills um, on the oyster mushrooms can go all the way down into the stem. And sometimes they say that the stem is, you know, really, really small. Um, this is kind of a sheet just for students to learn color. I'm learning that students love water coloring and I thought that this would be a really beautiful one if you're able to print it out on cardstock and just share kind of some um, fun mushroom facts. I'm going to scroll down. Uh, our next one is just a mushroom observation log. So working with kindergarten through sixth grade, um, I kind of keep it pretty open. Some students want to draw, some students want to be able to write notes. So kind of just leaving the square in the observation log um, empty for students just to kind of take it whatever path that they want. I, um, you know, these can definitely be printed out for multiple days. So if you want to do it for two weeks, a month longer, but just trying to keep it consistent as possible that we're going to try to do with our students and, and see how it goes. I think it's, um, Part of that kilo and it's just taking the time to really observe and um, right now we have the grow bags in our classroom and the students are just slowly some of them are taking interest just to see like how they can see the white mycelium kind of like growing and expanding in the bag and even though they're not seeing the mushrooms they're getting to see that process which is really cool and that can even start there like drawing these kind of web-like structures and I've also found that when you give a student a hand lens or some type of a tool like that, it kind of blows it up into like, I'm a scientist and a really empowering tool. So hopefully this is um, kind of a fun activity just to kind of keep track of it, make sure you know your mushrooms are doing well and, and watching how they grow and the observation of it all. Um, this was a really fun one to come up with. I realized is symmetry, um, coming up with Kilo and kind of defining a sense of place, you realize how many things from flowers to leaves to just 
a lot of things that we see every day are so symmetrical, even our own bodies and the animals that we have around us. So in this worksheet, it's talking all about symmetry. Um, we use a lot of different types of mushrooms, just again, to get students familiar with just not the oyster mushrooms, but other common mushrooms they might see in cooking. Um, so what they do with here is they just draw the second half of the missing, missing mushroom parts and kind of try to get it to match as best as I can. But I'm also a fan of letting students just kind of go where they want with things. Um, one last um, lesson that I created um, over at my work that I didn't get to share here is, let me bring it up, is this uh, mushroom dial. So it talks about the life cycle of a mushroom. And I know some of our other kumus are going to go into this a little bit more. But again, it just kind of goes through the really basic, because again, I'm still learning a lot and I can't go into as much depth as I would love to and hopefully we'll get to one day of just the life cycle of a mushroom, how it begins, if you can see in the brown circle from the spores, um, you know, all the way through from pinning to the fruiting body and then the sporing adult again. Um, a little information card, again, just to share um, just some really, cool facts about mushrooms just to help spark some interest. And then um, in the bottom corner is just the instructions how to do it for older students they can read through and, and help. But something like this, like a little craft or activity, I find it's, it's fun for the students. They get more involved. It's um, great conversation starters to kind of see where things go. But um, I'm gonna stop sharing screen. But all of this was really, really fun to create. Um, I'm really excited to work with the students more, especially in next week when we're gonna be really focusing on it to get some more feedback from them, from some of our other teachers at um, where I work to see what they think, what works, what doesn't. But um, yeah, that's kind of what I wanna do, I guess, with the younger students. I think crafts, pictures, you know, just, little information of um, fun facts, information, um, using hand lenses, <laughs> again, is a great tool. Just explaining what mushrooms really even are, um, safety procedures as well. And there's a lot of great free, like short little educational videos I found on YouTube researching it that are great just to kind of, um, you know, just make that spark happen, that connection. So. Yeah, um, anything that you guys want to know or feel that should be shared? I haven't been watching the chat box at all, so. Hi, Lauren. Um, so one of the questions is about the awesome mushroom wheel that you made. That one didn't end up in the packets. Is that something that you're willing to share with um, teachers um, or is that something yeah. that can't be shared at this time? Um, yeah, I can share it. Um, it might not be tonight, <laughs> but I can definitely get to, to you at some point. Awesome. Yeah, I have to tweak it a little bit, but and that's why it wasn't included, but I, I just wanted to share it because I think um, those little crafts and like the hands-on stuff is really beneficial for at least the age group I'm working on, you know. Um, I really like something that Loxley said earlier, um, and I had to like research it on my phone as this was going on about, um, you know, you don't hear much about native mushrooms. Like it was just something I never really thought about. So I definitely want to pull it back into a sense of place and here in Hawaii, because um, I do think that it is really, really important and it's a great education tool to connect. And what he was saying about how in our lowland areas where most people live, you know, you don't see the many native mushrooms, you have to go up into the forest. So I think it'd be really, really fun to bring like that observation log. Like if you're able to go on a nice hike or something in some of our upper forest, um, you know, taking it and like go on a, your own mushroom hunt, you know, a scavenger hunt and just, you know, don't necessarily pick or anything, but just observe what do you see. And if that's not possible, just even in your own yard, because I'm finding like after rains, there's all these cool mushrooms that pop up in unexpected places and it becomes a really fun, fun game, even with my own kids. Thank you. 
Yeah. I really love um, the observation log also. It's really simple, but even just as educators working with the mushrooms, getting to know the life cycle is so important because they go from this big to this big overnight. And so um, having a sense of the pace of the mushrooms is going to be really important for when you're planning or when to do certain activities with them. Um, so we'll be sharing um, these resources in a PDF format in a follow-up email, as well as posting them online. Um, and with that, I think we will pass it over to Ming Wei to introduce our next set of teachers. Thank you so Thank much, Lauren. You. Mahalo, Lauren. Mahalo, Lauren. Um, so these um, next two teachers again, I realize we're all from Hawaii Island, yeah? So, <laughs> so I, we met, let me, let me do Rod first, right? So um, on Hawaii Island, we have a really amazing program called Ku Ainapa, and it's a school garden teacher training program, and we have it every summer. And I've been blessed to do Ku Ainapa, co-facilitate Ku Ainapa with Amanda Ryu, who's also one of our hosts tonight, for 12 years. Or oh, is it 13 now, Amanda? And um, we met Rod at Kuainapa, I want to say maybe set cohort one, one. cohort two. Sure. So that means Rod was like 11 or 12 summers ago and an exceptional educator, um, also a voyager and most of all, a wonderful family man. He really, really cares and loves his family. Fast forward to five years ago. Oh, I'm getting all my years mixed up. DJ High, Douglas High, joins us also for Kuainapa. And again, um, another amazing educator, uh, just really curious about life and garden, is a very new dad. DJ and Rod have the amazing privilege of working together as a team at Kamehameha Schools. DJ is the culinary arts teacher and Rod is the agriculture teacher. So without any further ado, I'm gonna pass the time to DJ and Rod and they are going to share with us about mycelium running. Over to Mahalo. you guys. Mahalo, Mahalo Mingwei. Mahalo Mingwei. Uh, yep, Rod Floro, we're um, middle school uh, ag teacher and as DJ. We're also the content curators for um, uh, at KS underscore Aina to Opu on Instagram. So I'm the Aina side. This is the Opu side, but I kind of have more of the Opu, but whatever, <laughs> bottom line. Because um, we make good food. We make good food. That's the bottom line. Um, yeah, so anyway, I like to talk about mycelium. Super fascinating. So in your grow bags, you kind of see it starting up already. Um, it can be kind of related as like the, um, the vegetative part of your, of your mushroom. Okay? And so like kind of there's like the, the root part. I have a spent grow bag and you can kind of see the, looks kind of fuzzy and hairy. And the cool part is that um, the mycelium actually forms this relationship with, uh, uh, with uh, plants. It's called mycorrhizae. And so some of you might notice that on your on, um, soil bags that you purchase, like on um, Pro Mix or Sunshine Mix, you'll kind of see that as one of the additives. But it's cool because it's like the symbiotic association between our um, between fung between fungi and plants. And um, so, but anyway, um, you know, what? my throat is like sorry. I've been kind of in meetings all day, and my throat is like super dry. Um, you know, uh, and I don't know if you guys know this, but Kumu DJ and I have our own like. Michael Risey network. Kumo, is it, DJ, is your um is your network online? Um, yeah, we're good. We're good. It's online. Okay, because yeah. like my throat is super super dry right now. Oh, that's too and, bad. You know, you got you got anything cold to drink? Can, can you hook um, me up over here know, in Pana Eva? I just I just powered my water, but um, my wife she left me a really nice um, one of these sparkling waters. Um, are you interested? Yeah, I'm about can you can you send one over? Yeah, the Wait, network. Uh, Terry, give me like one sec. Okay, okay. Yep. Put them in my whoop, network. Ooh, that went quick. Hmm. Is it coming? Pana Eva, we gotta come down the hill from Mountain. Pana Eva. It's I don't know. Nothing's nothing's happening yet. No. 
Nothing's it's happening. Not right. on my end. I get empty. Is it gone? Okay. Oh, you know what? Eh, 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 eh. Right on. Okay. Cool. Okay. So one of the cool oh, things okay. about mycorrhizae is that it p- passes on water to um, plants. Sorry. It, uh, plants pass on water to the fungus. And that's one of the benefits of having that relationship between plants and fungi. And um, Rob, thank you so much for this. Oh, super awesome. I'm like super parched. Hey, no worries. No worries. Oh, man. Whew. Thank goodness. Perfect. So that's, that's like a connection. Yeah, like that oh, you yeah. and I just, just made. Right. And, you know, like I, I'm hop- hoping you can hook me up, man, because like, you know, I'm um, looking for some like sugar, but you got some sugar, extra sugar. sugar. Um, um, because like, you know, I know that you can pass that around the, the network too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, uh, we try to keep low, you know, like no sugar drinks in our house. That's why it was sparkling water. But, Understandable. Uh, yeah. Was it that, that's the, the blue sugar you, you, you've been craving, right? Blue sugar, man. You got, you got um, some of that. Yeah. Weirdly enough, my wife put another pack of the, that blue sugar. Let me, let me throw that into your network there. Okay, cool. Because with, um, I know that's going to help with, with your carbohydrates and your development. Yeah. Oftentimes plants make an excess of carbohydrates and then as a result, they share some of those sugars with, uh, with fungi via the mycorrhizae connection. So is it in, is it, are you, what's happening? Yeah, you, it's, I mean, it's standing, rolling down standing. the hill. We got, you know, again, mountain view to floating up. So okay. Rolling. Hey, what you, Oh, look at that. Right on. Bro. Thank you so much, man. Oh, I'll hey, take care of that later. The blue sugar, no sure. can be. And the cool part about it, it's, it's like a give and take kind of situation. So it's not just the, the, the fungi, fungi kind of taking, taking, but the fungi can also um, hook the plants up with stuff like um, nitrogen and phosphorus. And, you know, DJ, you, you need anything like that? You need some nitrogen phosphorus? Yeah. Um, I, I've been noticing my plants with some nitrogen deficiencies. I don't know if you have okay. any. I know you got those bags of pro mix and whatnot. Yep. Yep. So here we go. I'm going to hook you up, man. Hook you up with okay. some. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be Stand great. By. So again, the fungi, what it does is it passes on the nitrogen and p- passes on the phosphorus. And these are actually pretty tough nutrients for plants to uptake. But the cool part is the mycorrhizae actually will pass that on. Okay, incoming, bro. Hope you got something. Yep, you ready? You ready? Um, hey, we're, we're waiting. Those, those mamaki need some nitrogen. Okay. Ooh, so, ooh. yep, should be headed your way. And... Wow, we're we're going uphill, so gravity doesn't really seem to matter. But doesn't matter. Oh, thanks, man. Right on, right on. Happy to happy to help you out there, bro. So, um, you know, we'd like to, uh, yeah, just you know, it, there's this really cool relationships between plants and my mycelium. Um, really, we saw some super cool slides and super cool imagery about um those relationships and like what results from that. So, um. The lesson that we came up with is actually based on mycelium running, and DJ is going to introduce that. Yeah. So we, um, sorry, let me. I gotta gotta get serious now. I gotta focus on something. Um, <laughs> let me go ahead and share my screen with you folks. Um, thanks for putting up with Rod and I. A little slapstick there for you. Um, so we uh, we worked on a lesson together and. and part of our goal throughout this was to really um, hone in on students' own curiosity with their interest in Kilo and, and getting out and observing, getting them away from these Zoom screens and going outside, um, but also to still kind of have a little bit of depth um, when it comes to standards alignments and stuff. So our, ours is, is guided for a sixth to eighth grade science class. Um, however, we kept it pretty bare bones so that it can be flexed up or down um, depending on the needs of the student, the parent, the teacher, wherever you guys want to use it. Um, so really, we just start with a basic kilo. Go out and see where you find mycelium. Flip over a log, kick over a mulch pile, um, and just kind of see what's going on. So using all of your senses except for taste, um, we're encouraging students to go out um, and really see what they can find. So kind of giving them an example photo here to go with, to run and, and, and explore. Um, and then our observation sheet, sorry, it's, uh, I don't even know if I know how to rotate it on here. Um, <laughs> you can turn your computers or maybe you have your packet in your hand. Um, 
But using an example, just kind of going about and trying to find these trends and patterns and where you really see these mycelium growing. Um, what does it look like? What does it smell like? How does that earth feel? How does that mycelium itself feel? Um, and then kind of hoping that they begin to lead towards this idea of it going toward plants or it's going toward a certain type of tree. And then over time, maybe they see these patterns, maybe they don't. Um, but just that beginning of observation as an initial hook. Um, so that's kind of the outdoors, go out, explore, get dirty um, that Rod and I really like to do. Um, and we know that a lot of students like to do as well. So hopefully that's, that's kind of a, a hook for them. Um, and then as we move on, it kind of gets a little bit deeper as far as standards and science, um, um, science observations and using data. One of the goals that we're really focusing on with our classes is being able to use data to support a claim um, and back it up. And I know a lot of folks are kind of in those similar tracks where that, that's something that's beneficial for them. Um, so to kind of do this, we want to give them some background information, but we used a real study that was actually done by ecologist Suzanne Simard um, to kind of show this interconnectedness between different plant species. Um, so I don't want to give away all the details of it, but I'll let uh, Mr. Flora let you share a little bit about uh, maybe what's in that article um, and then how that could connect to our data activity. Awesome. Yep. So bottom line, the, the overall overarching question was, can my CM help transfer nutrients between plants? And so what they did was they, they kind of did a test on um, plants, um, shade, partially shade and sun. And yeah, again, we're not going to give any, any spoilers away, but uh, the, um, the final portion of that is actually, yep, there we go. Um, helps students kind of look at, look at um, that a little bit more uh, critically and kind of think about um, you know, the larger effect in a, in a forest setting, in a more natural setting. Yeah, and so by trying to build a little bit more understanding of data without being too daunting, um, our hope is that students, you know, even third grade really could look at this all the way up. Um, you know, you could extrapolate. We did link in, it should be, I believe where that study initially came from, um, where there is more data. It's much more in depth if you did want to go to it. Um, if you just Google the Simard, um, initial study that she did, it's, it's pretty easy to find online. Um, if you wanted to build it in to go up to a higher eighth grade, ninth grade, 12th grade um, level. And then just kind of following these guiding questions, you know, what, what do you notice? What do you see? How does that transfer impact those other plants around it? So really trying just to get a basic understanding of um, mycelium being nutrient pathways and, and helping out other plants in the area um, while keeping it kind of standards based, but not too daunting for a lot of students at home, um, a lot of parents who may be leading this for their students or their child. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's something that you guys can utilize, whether you're a, a student, a parent, a teacher, um, and you know, we're, we're always open to feedback. So feel free to let us know um, what you guys think and what you use, and then maybe we can adapt it as well. I'll go ahead and stop sharing then. Um, I'm not sure Thank if there's- so much, DJ and Rod. Um, everybody's just loving how interactive your, your, your presentations are and, and enjoying, um, enjoying that so much. It makes it very meaningful for our Kiki. Uh, way cool. Everybody's like doing clap, clap, clap. So thank you so much. Um, you didn't get too many questions and we are running late. So I want to make sure, Kristen, back to you. You guys are a tough act to follow, I'll say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> you guys are so lucky to have each other to be able to play off. That's so awesome. Um, so real quick, super mini lesson. Um, I'm just going to point you guys to a little art activity that you can do with your mushroom. So if you guys look at your packet, see how the back page is this bright red? That was on purpose. Um, so this page you can actually use to make spore prints or spore print art with. Let me really quick pull up an example for you. I'll do that at the end actually, um, to show you what things can look like. Um, but like Noah said, um, your mushrooms here, they have spores coming out right down here at the base of the gills. 
Um, and the spores, they are invisible to the eye. And so the awesome thing about making spore prints is we can make the invisible visible even without a microscope. So if you wanna make your own spore print art, all you do is take um, one of your mushrooms, the flatter the better, and you are gonna lay it um, flat on your sheet of paper. Um, if you put a little bit of water on top, that can help. You can also compare and contrast different types of mushrooms. I have a portobello mushroom here that you can lay on top of your paper. And afterwards, what you do is you'll just, it's helpful to take a bowl and cover your whole setup um, that way. So if you see here, um, just covering your different options. Um, and if you leave them for overnight, 12 hours, if you come back, you have a little piece of art like this. Uh, you'll notice that the oyster mushrooms have white spores, so that's why we picked red. The portobello mushrooms, you'll find that they have um, dark brown spores. Um, so the nice thing about the red paper is that you can see, um, compare and contrast different types of spores. Um, and if you want to preserve it for later, you can just take a little hairspray um, and spray that on to fix it. Just don't get too close or you will um, spray off all your spores into infinite dust. Um, but that's a fun way that you can explore the spores without having a microscope on hand. Um, and I know it's been a lot, so we are gonna take a quick five minute break. Um, so come back here at 6.15. I'm gonna- I'll put up a slide for what they're gonna do during break, Kristen. Yes, I will do that. I'll put up a slide for what we're gonna do. And I'm also gonna put a little poll. So if you're bored, just uh, let's figure out who's here. How many teachers, students, who do you got here? So with that, um, we'll see you guys back here at 6.15. And I'm getting all going here. How do you put a poll and a slide up at the same time? Is that possible? Um, I think that it's harder to see the slide. Let's see. Oh, okay. But go ahead, take a break and um, start to get together your um, materials you're going to need for the cooking lesson that we're having later. Sorry. Too many tabs. Mingwei, can you put it up really quick? Mine's lost. Sure, 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 sure. Share screen. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So, um, we're going on a five minute break, come back at 6.15, but then get up, get ready to cook along with Chef Terry. We need a saucepan, large skillet, um, a chopping board and knife, unless you've already chopped up your mushrooms, spatulas and butter, flour. Uh, if you have vegetable or chicken broth, if you're gonna do it um, vegetarian, you're gonna go with vegetable broth. Um, sour cream, if you have, I don't have, so I'm going to try to use yogurt <laughs> and salt and pepper to taste, but um, start gathering your things and set up to cook. And we'll see you back here at 6.15 and we'll stay on if people want to um, talk story as well, but yeah. Yeah, we do have one more lesson from Terry before we cook. And it's so funny for um, Oahu people to hear Koki frogs over the, over the Zoom, huh? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna run and get my stuff too. I have to go, I, I, I need to get my flower. Uh, I am, wait. Oh, how did you put up the poll? I don't see the poll because I'm a co-host. Is that what it is, Jade? Christine? Uh -huh. I think so. I see it, Mingwei. No, I mean, I can't answer it because I'm a yeah. co-host. Oh, okay, I better go get my flower. I'll be right back. culture teachers we have in Hawaii. Any school farm he touches is transformed into an oasis of food. So when I met Terry Moniz, you were the ag teacher way down south, yeah, in Ka'u. And it was amazing that, mm -hmm. that 
community had um, an amazing school farm and you were there and, and just doing what you do, you know, head down, ha -ah, ha ah humble, working with the children in the soil. And then uh, Terry transferred up to KL High School and inherited a bog, didn't you? you like, basically inherited a swamp. And then you had to also transform that farm into um, a working farm with your students in Cal High School. And so we look to Terry as, as a real leader um, and, and his style of leadership is very quiet um, in, in our school farms. And also big secret, Terry likes to smoke meat. So uh, over to you, Terry. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing uh, your mana'o with us and, and teaching us more about um, organic, inorganic, and, and things we can use possibly for substrate. Oh my God, you, you're much too kind. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I, I am the one that's uh, honored to be here amongst these teachers who are mentors um, to me. I, I got to work uh, with Ms. Dement through the Teaching Change Program and, and Roddy was here at Cal High School and was, was quite the, the leader in science education. So I am amongst the elite and we're honored to be here with them today. Um, shoot, can you guys see my shared screen? Yes, we can. Okay, okay cool. So I, the whole approach tonight for me when I was asked to do this was you know, what can we do for the shut-ins, the kids who are, are not getting out there um, to their schools? And what can we do at home to work with our, with our ohana? And so this is kind of what I, I put together um, just so we could work with our folks at home um, during these COVID times. So <clears throat> I was having dinner with a friend the other week and, and he really, um, it just hit me when he told me he works um, over at Pu'anahulu, um, as most of you know, we truck most of our, rest, uh, our materials there now, and to the tune of eight to 10 truckloads a day. And I thought, man, what could we do, you know, in our homes to help curb the transportation of that waste? So um, with that in mind, we put together a log sheet for you, your children, and your entire um, ohana, uh, even the kupuna and your family, to collect the refuge for two days, separate it out, uh, into buckets, reuse, recycle, compost, and then, you know, uh, landfill, um, and have a discussion about why you put it in these containers. Um, instead of, you know, watching the TV, let's dialogue at night and talk about, talk about these things. Um, and I have an example uh, here on the screen. By the way, on my PowerPoint here is, is cut, it's a cut short version of what I, I have um, in the packets for you guys. So it's just kind of a condensed version of what you'll see there today. Um, like I said, uh, discuss with your family what was placed in these bins. Um, talk about the word reuse, recycle, compost. Uh, compost is great food. We do it here at the school. Um, we talk about what is organic, which is a plant or animal substance that, de that decomposes or decays. What is inorganic? We talk about plastics uh, that doesn't come from plant or animals per se. Uh, and it cannot be composted. Um, basically, we talk about how meats, fats, bones should not go into the, the bins as they attract pests, odors, diseases, and of course our neighborhood dogs, especially here at Keao High. Um, <laughs> composting is nature's uh, way of recycling. Uh, of course, you know the fungi you have today are wonderful at decomposing organic matter. Um, Mingwei did mention, um, we are segueing some of these kits. Uh, we're, we're experimenting. We are by no means um, have gone very far. We're trying to perfect the uh, sterile technique, um, but we do plan to uh, utilize straw that we pick up from a local garden store. Fud us from our wood shop. They work with different kind of woods. Of course, uh, the non-treated types. Uh, we're looking at even banana leaves, paper shreds, uh, coconut husks, and the like to, to try to um, take some of this spawn and, and, and create our own um, oyster mushrooms in our own substrates. And that's really at the beginning stages right now. Um, but composting is something we do often. Uh, as I said, 
I've kind of geared this um, for the younger groups to do at home with their ohana. So I have a compost activity sheet we put together that you can go through with your children uh, and look at what's organic, circle them, have discussions about styrofoam and, and the negativity of it in our, in our um, uh, transfer stations. Um, and just, you know, have, have some nice deep discussions. Um, I have another compost worksheet here, putting an X on the things that are not compostable, hoping to get that in their heads, um, not to get that you know, in, into your compost uh, bins at home. Uh, more activities in your book um, that you can work on with your children, uh, taking the word compost and coming up with some uh, words that basically, um, like C for carrot, something that's ca uh, compostable, or a carrot top, O for an orange peel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so getting into composting a little bit, real briefly, um, I talked with my kids about what is cold composting versus hot composting. Cold composting in a nutshell is just adding organic matter pile upon pile, um, the lazy man style of composting and, and um, you know, something that's gonna take a while to do. Um, hot composting, the process where we, again, we talk more about the carbon uh, cycle where we um, have both carbon and nitrogen uh, at a ratio of 30 to one. The kids play with those ratios and we see what we get out of it. Um, the, the brown waste is stuff like the straw in your kits, dry leaves, twigs, branches, etc. The green waste being stuff like vegetables, grass clippings, and again, you know, in a perfect world, we do a 30 to one ratio. We have the kids play with it in their own little compost piles and see what comes of it. Um, if you were to do it in your home uh, and you were looking for perfection, you wanna let that sit for about five days and then you start turning it around. Um, my little drawing here of, of our compost bin, uh, browns, greens, browns, greens. Um, again, really in a nutshell kind of, of, of comp um, composting activity. Again, the kids can play with it. Um, those little black lines, we add our own indigenous microorganisms, basically a soil with whatever microorganisms are found here at Cal High School and um, play with those ratios too, to see what would be the most ideal um, and quick compost turnaround. Okay, because compost is fertilizer, that is money in the kids' pockets when we produce those vegetable crops. Um, I, I know our soil that was trucked in here uh, many, many years ago um, is pretty downright blah. Uh, you know, it's plantation soil. There was no arsenic found in it, thank gosh, else it would have shut us down. Um, but we're trying to build soil tilth um, by making a lot of compost and and adding it back into that swamp that Mingwe talks about of a garden that we have here at the school. Um, again, more compost puzzles to work with. Uh, I know we're short on time. So the, the kids uh, can do this at home if you don't have the space, um, making your own fun activity, um, teaching the children how to make predictions and observations and drawings by making your own jar with organic and inorganic waste. This is a cool way to teach the youth what is organic and inorganic. So here's something we did in our classroom. We took strawberry guava, we took a, oh, 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 we took a fat product, we took a pork rind, uh, we took some aluminum foil, some paper, um, some plastic wrap, and then the, allow the kids, of course, to always choose a mystery product, let them have a lot of input, uh, we get it out there, uh, use some of the soil from the school. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the water we put in there in a second. And boom, one week later, oops, what do we have? Oops, I'm sorry, went a little too far. We start seeing changes uh, in the organic waste. Again, have discussions with your child, uh, make some observations, have them do some writing activities. Uh, you know, in the vocational classes, we're always trying to have the kids do more writing. Uh, not just working with their hands. Um, and then, you know, uh, oh my gosh, look, there's some worms in there. Talk about the use of organics uh, and meat products and why, why are we seeing these worms here? Are they good? Are they bad? Um, have some discussions about that. And the fun part is adjusting stuff. 
do some of this stuff in a closet. Do it out in the hot sun. Does it make a difference uh, in, in the time that it takes for these organics to break down? Um, how about soil and IMOs from other parts of the island, different kinds of microorganisms from different parts of the island? Vary the amount of water you use. Uh, make it anaerobic. What happens in an anaerobic situation? Here in East Hawaii, we got a lot of rain. What do you do when it rains? Uh, cover our compost pile. How long can we leave it covered? Um, and just play with that stuff. The sky's the limit. And the kids learn by discovering. It's not always going to work out very well. You're not always going to get compost, um, but it's lots of fun. Um, thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you, Terry. Um, one moment, let me see. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, Terry, could you quickly stop the share on your screen, please? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, does anyone have any questions? It was, the best ones from Lanai, they have what they call deer raisins. And we're being polite. Um, and uh, it, that will be really something great to use in your compost pile, all those little deer raisins. Can we get that last curriculum with a jar? Krista, it's in, it's in the packet. I hope. Okay, it's in there, yeah. All right, I think we um, need to move on, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we cut up time. So with that, um, first of all, thank you so much for just bringing up compost and all the conversations around mycelium. I don't know if we've really said it directly, but once you are done harvesting your mushrooms, don't throw away what's inside the bag. Put it in your garden, make compost with it. Um, you've got the mycelium there to really um, help out your soil. Um, so next up, we have Terry Langley, who is going to be doing some cooking with us. So hopefully you have all your ingredients ready. Um, you know, Terry has touched every aspect of the food system out here in Waianae, it feels like, from um, being, you know, boots on the ground, um, farm organic certification, um, to being a master food preserver and food extraordinaire, um, to also now really working with education. You might see her a lot on the Makeup Mondays with Pals and Places. Um, so I will turn it over to Terry to get cooking. Mahalo, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I've learned so much tonight. Um, Christian did gift me with a packet of my own of mushrooms to grow so we'd be ready to go tonight. But of course I have no green thumb uh, and they didn't work <laughs> or a brown thumb as it may be. So um, I'm not gonna give up because I think I found out what I did wrong. It's very humid where I live. I'm on Oahu in Eva Beach and it's been super humid and very, very hot but I don't think it's been humid enough. So um, I'll be trying again and let Christian know how I did. So tonight I'm going to cook something called um, creamy mushroom dip. I am not a chef. I just love being in the kitchen. This is my total happy place. So I hope everybody got a chance to get the ingredients. Um, I'm just going to show you what we've been doing so far. So it's a really simple, simple um, recipe. My auntie used to make it when I was a kid. But when I was doing some research online, um, it's everywhere. So it must have been a really popular uh, recipe. And this was the only mushroom thing that I would actually eat when I was a child. So this recipe is definitely kid friendly. Um, your keiki will love it. They'll also love helping you get in the kitchen and prepare. Um, so let's get on with it. Let's see. So I just wanted to show you these. These were what the store, uh, Safeway, is calling the mushroom. So they're calling these oyster mushrooms and they're very, very leggy as you can see. Um, so now I know how that happened. Um, and they're not near as fresh as the ones that someone in Makaha is actually growing. And they were really, really very large um, caps to them. And I tried to get them, but I was a little bit late on my order. So I ended up having to buy these from the store. So we're making the best of it. Uh, what I have in this first pan here is a bunch of chopped mushrooms. So two, three to four cups, two to three cups, whatever you have on hand will work. Um, and I just wanted to show you really quickly how I, how I chopped them. It's, I cleaned them. Usually you have to clean mushrooms. They grow on a substrate that um, sometimes is very woody. And so I just take a simple paper towel and just wipe off whatever I think might be dirt. Um, I also sometimes cut off this little 
woody part down here. And then that goes in my compost pile. Absolutely loves it. So I just very rough chop these. And I'm sorry, chefs, uh, culinary teachers. I am not a chef. So <laughs> I probably don't have a lot of knife skills. I'm going to cut these probably to a like quarter inch, half inch dice. Um, only because that is the way that I like to eat them in the final recipe. So you want to make sure um, you can see the mushroom and you get a bunch of its flavor when you bite into it. So that's probably good enough. So this mixture that I have in the pan, this one was um, cooked with half of the liquid. So tonight we're going to use, I am a vegetarian, so we're going to use an organic vegetable broth. You can use, you could even use water or you can use any other kind of broth that, um, that suits you. So I put half of it in here. There are two cups in the recipe. Half is already in here and I cooked it down to where there's really not much liquid left in there. Now I wanna put that back on the fire and I'm gonna put in the other half a cup. I'm sorry, the other cup of my broth and I'm just gonna let that come up to a boil. So while we're doing that in another pan, um, you can make the roux. So I don't know if everybody's always made a roux, but boy, when I discovered that, I was totally excited because this is two ingredients that can thicken anything from a stew to a dip to anything that you've got going. So I've just got this one on the back burner and I am going to uh, let it just boil up a little bit, even it out in the pan. And then in here, I have my flour. So there's about six tablespoons of flour in here. It may look a little darker because uh, as we were speaking earlier, Ming Wei was asking me, oh, isn't it a good idea to um, brown it a little bit first or toast it a little bit? And I said, oh, you are a brilliant young lady. So we did that, Ming Wei. And I'm gonna turn my fire on here and then I'm gonna add my butter. So I have my butter. I'm sure everybody uses their leftover spam containers for their butter. We're gonna use about four tablespoons. I'm eyeballing right now of butter. It says unsalted. Um, that's from a health standpoint. You can use salted butter. There's no culinary reason that you couldn't. Uh, it's just that usually broth, any vegetable, any kind of broth that you use tends to have a lot of salt in it, so. Um, unsalted will also not give it any much flavor. Okay, so this is probably salty. So what I'm gonna do with this is I am just going to stir it around and mix it in. And I really want my roux to start to change a little bit darker color. So you can see as the butter is getting in there, it's starting to bubble a little bit. This stage should only really take a couple minutes. You just wanna really incorporate all of your butter there. And it's starting to smell um, a little bit nutty. Really good. Mine was a little dark to begin with, so I'm gonna let it go just a little bit longer, but you're looking for sort of a darky color like this. And this is all, and I'm gonna set it aside and just let that cool for a minute until this one comes up to a boil. So as soon as the other one comes back up to a boil, got it on high. I'm gonna add my roux in there and it is gonna to start to really thicken everything up. I can actually put these in just so we don't waste. I love the composting. I love zero waste. I am a very much zero waste cook. I'm currently stationed at Hoa Aina o Makaha, which is a beautiful, beautiful farm down in Makaha um, run by Gigi Coquillo, which I'm sure most of you know. If you don't, you have to meet me. So this is starting to bubble up a little bit. And I'm going to add that straight into my other mushroom mixture, which is now also starting to boil. So it's looking good. We're boiling all over the place. We're getting it in there. I'm going to stir this in. And then this will start to thicken this dish and um, you really want it just to kind of coat the back of the screen. I'm sorry, the back of the spoon. <laughs> and it's starting to thicken up already. You can see how good it is. And boy, is it really starting to smell. Anybody else cooking along that's got that delicious, nutty, healthy umami smell going right now? I love it. So. I'm sorry, I'm getting way too much steam for you. But we came up to a boil. 
We're very soft now. Um, it's very thick. And we're gonna take that off the fire. So I'm actually gonna turn the camera a little bit here. Turn that off, Terry. And it says, the recipe says to let it cool a little bit before you put in your sour cream. So we're just going to do a quick little taste here. It's always so important to taste. And this is what I love about working with Keiki is that, you know, this is the fun part for them. They have chopped and stirred and everything. And the fun part is really about tasting. Oh, it's really good, you guys. It's very, very salty already. So I probably won't add any salt, but if I did, I would just put maybe a half of a teaspoon of um, Hawaiian salt in there. And then you always need some cracked black, right? That makes everything better. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of pepper in here as well. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add my sour cream. It's not gonna thicken up quite as much, but I have uh, just regular plain sour cream. And this is a 16 ounce container and you're gonna wanna use about half of it. So I'm just gonna spoon it in there. Very, very gently. And then I'm just gonna fold it in. And that all can be done with the same spoon on the same, there we go. Oh, it smells so delicious. You know, we're getting really close to Thanksgiving. Um, I was gonna tell all the cakey that were around that you can definitely use your mushrooms um, in the stuffing that mom or auntie or whoever is making, possibly even you, um, for Thanksgiving. And all you need to do really is take your regular mush or your regular stuffing recipe and it probably already maybe even calls for mushrooms um, and add the mushrooms into that. You can add any kind of oysters, um, anything, any kind of mushrooms that you have in the fridge, anything that you see in the store that you're really excited to try. Okay, that was so fast and easy. And now we are just gonna plate it up a little bit. I always tell people, you know, food is always eaten by your eyes first, right? So when you're plating, plate it as if you were making it for tutu. So you know it's gonna turn out the best, right? Because you're making it for grandma. And then I had a couple flowers here. They may have wilted a little bit throughout. There you go. And you've got a nice warm dip here. You could put a little bit of um, chives on top, basil, any anything that you have growing in your garden. You can put green onion. Um, just a little bit of garnish would be good. Uh, it's good just like this. So get out your crustinis, your little uh, toast baguette and or your crackers or your favorite, whatever you wanna put this on because it is really, really good. You can put it in a uh, airtight container if you don't eat it all. Um, and it should last for three or four days in there, not a problem. So there we are, you guys, super, super simple, five ingredient creamy mushroom dip, all the way from Oahu. <laughs> Oh my gosh, is it dinner time yet? I'm so hungry. You're so yeah. right about eating with your eyes, Terry. Good, that's where we start. <laughs> um, one quick question. I see Ming Wei is using um, yogurt with hers. Can you just quickly speak to um, any kind of ingredient substitutions like yogurt or anything else? Yeah, uh, we already talked about any kind of mushrooms that you want to use. So you could use anything and just use the exact same process. Um, I think Ming Wei's is going to come out really, really ono. I think it might be a little bit more tangy. Um, yogurt tends to be a little bit tangy, but she's also gonna have the added benefit of um, probiotics, which I am so into fermenting. <laughs> um, so she'll have a little bit of, of really good, good stuff in there. Um, I just think it might be a little tangier. You can usually balance that out with a little bit of salt. Yeah, how is it Mingwei? Right on. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm still making the flour and the butter part and okay. then the mushrooms sit in the broth. Nice. Yeah, they soak it up and they get really nice and soft, but you also still have that, um, you know, that little bit of texture to it. So it's not something that is, it is called the creamy dip and it is very creamy because of the sour cream, but it also has a little bit of bite to it. So you get to taste all of those mushrooms and that, that is up to you folks, how you decide to chop them. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I Thank think you. I'm going to have mine on top of, instead of a dip, 
I just asked my husband to get some burgers going. Oh, we'll see if we can put that on top, and instead of the adding salt, the burgers might be salty enough, and we'll just like a like a fake Salisbury steak, you know, Ooh, kind of beautiful, thing going on, right? Yeah. Sounds delicious. Mahalo for having me, you guys. I hope this is a good one for you. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Oh, wonderful, everybody. We got caught up with time. Yeah, Kristen? Perfect. Yeah. So uh, do you want to share your screen or? I can share mine. Yeah, because I turned mine off so I could cook. <laughs> So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, just some advertisement, commercials, commercials. Uh, our next webinar, if you enjoyed this one, has all to do with teas. Our next webinar uh, for our local food toolkit webinar series is called Teas for Resilience. And just like this webinar, how you got a, something to work with, um, we are busy growing and harvesting and drying herbs and spices from Hawaii Island to create into toolkits to send out to whoever registers. And it'll be the same um, template where we use teas to think about our place and deep observation, uh, followed by learning how to grow some of these herbs and spices so that you can have your own tea. Um, but also with the word resilience, we're gonna look at the practice of making tea and drinking tea with keiki and haumana as a way to calm everybody down and prepare us. We are in tumultuous times. And so we thought that this would be a really, really great topic to share with uh, parents, teachers and community members. And so um, our next webinar is Saturday, November the 21st, please join us. And then, um, Kristen, if you can, because my hands are a little <laughs> ruey, can you drop the tiny URL, the exit um, survey, into the chat? So please, everyone, if you don't mind, um, if you don't mind, please fill out an exit survey so that we can improve, continuously improve our work and our webinars, and to um, get um, get your feedback. And then now I want to turn it over to Amanda for a round of thank yous. Amanda, you're so good at this. Um, Kristen, Kristen's multitasking. <laughs> Kristen, if you could put back the uh, screen with all the logos, I want to give Amanda an opportunity to, I want to hear her voice. And Amanda, um, please mahalo all our partners and sponsors. I do want to mahalo all of our sponsors. Also, I want to really mahalo all of you for being here today. I know that our lives are busy and we spend a lot of time on screens. I want to mahalo the folks who presented today. Um, that was really fun. I hope you guys got some good activities, things you can do right away with your ohana, with your students, um, even in your own homes. One more workshop I wanted to mention. Um, going along with the T's for resilience, we have tools for emotional resilience workshop coming up um, on November 14th. It's on Saturday. I just put a little bit about it in the chat box. Uh, it's based on the work of Joanna Macy. And if you want a little more information about it, you can go to the high sign. That's Hawaii Island School Garden Network. So it's H-I-S-G-N dot org network dot uh, org um, website and sign up for that. We would really like to, um, to thank the County of Hawaii who has been very supportive of these workshops, um, really making these workshops possible. This is our county money serving our community. So that's something that is really tremendous. And that is, um, this is new, we're a new venture for them. So um, thank you to our county for allowing us to do that. It enables us to get the, all the materials together and to get the wonderful presenters. Um, I'd like to thank the Get Local, the UH, um, the UH Cooperative Extension, the Places, Pals and Places, um, the Center for Getting Things Done, which is Ming Wei's organization in um, the south part of Big Island, Opala Foods, who provided the mushrooms, which is really wonderful. And that's something that you may be able to get these, um, 
you may be able to get these mushroom bags for your own for your own keiki. If you're looking at working with um, with big groups of kids, they're they're not too hard to transport. We now have some <laughs> some practice with that. So um, feel free to reach out to Opala Foods if you want to do this project with your students with actual mushroom bags. If you didn't get some this time, um, and also the Hawaii Island School Garden Network, which Ming Wei and I have been working with for many years, is um, sponsoring this workshop. So thank you all. Um, your your surveys really help us, as Ming Wei said, to get better. They help us to um, let the people who supported this work know that it's meaningful to you or what else you would like to hear from us. So um, thank you all. And um, also, I really want to thank Kristen, who did a great job emceeing this. Ming Wei and I were like, yeah, we're going to have you do that. And you did a really um, just a great job. Thank you for bringing everyone together and um, for emceeing the evening. Mahalo Nui. So let's close with um, Oli Mahalo. I will, unless somebody else is going to volunteer, I will do my best. Um, and Kristen will put up the words, but um, we're about to have dinner. We just spent two hours together um, learning with each other, from each other, through each other. And so I will do my best um, to Mahalo everyone and very excited about eating my roux. So, um, Uhoa ia kamaka loa la Pua ike aloha la Kuka ia kahalo wa la Pavehi mana lehua my kaho uku ia kahala vaila Mahalo eke akua Mahalo ena kupuna la ea Mahalo ke e alohala Mahalo me ke alohala Hello everyone, have a wonderful evening. Enjoy growing your mushrooms and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Mahalo.